since the beginning of time, people have been striving after invincibility, or what the Latins call um, invictus. Um, I think all of us in this room here desire to be in control of our lives. And I think we'd all would love to be in control of our circumstances as well. The reason why you buy a lottery ticket is not for the money. You buy a lottery ticket for the hopes of being able to fulfill your dreams, to be able to control your circumstances better. It's really all about this idea of invictus. And if we were really honest with ourselves and kind of really look deep within us, we have this desire even to control other people. Disagree? Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been mad or frustrated or even gave some consequences to your husband or to your wife, your kids, your mom or your dad, a coworker, a classmate, uh, maybe a friend or even your dog? Have you ever been mad or frustrated at any of them because they didn't do what you wanted them to do? Yeah, that's about being invictus. We like to be in control. If you've ever thought in your mind, you know what, if I could just get my life under control, that's a desire for Invictus. If you've ever thought, you know, if I were in control, dot, 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 it's all about Invictus. And if you ever said or thought, you know what, if they would just do what I tell them to do, that's about Invictus. And when we don't feel invincible, When we feel vulnerable and we feel like our circumstances are out of control or people in our lives are out of control or we can't control them and the way that they're behaving affects us, when that happens to us, we have all sorts of emotions that that go on inside of us. Sometimes we're afraid. We're afraid of what might happen. Maybe at work there's rumors that, um, that there are going to be some layoffs. You can't control that and so you freak out because you don't know what's going to happen to you and, and to your family. You may have been in a situation before where she wasn't calling you back. And you're like going, Is she, what's going on here? And you begin to freak out because you don't know what that means because you can't control her. Sometimes we get depressed when we don't feel um, invincible or when we feel like our life is out of control. Or that it just didn't, we weren't able to control it at all. And so we look back at our past and we go, you know what? My marriage didn't turn out the way that I thought it would be. Um, my kids didn't turn out the way that I thought it would be. I had all these dreams for my career, and it didn't even come close to, to what I thought it would, would turn out to be. And so we can feel a sense of depression or sadness that we weren't able to control or manage our lives the way that we wanted, and we didn't get the outcomes that we wanted. And sometimes we just give up. We just kind of go, we just become numb. And we just say, okay, you win. All right, whatever. You have it your way. All right, yes, dear. Yeah, kids, Whatever. You know, as long as we just don't rock the boat, we just kind of cruise. Because, hey, you're, you're, it, it doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to get what you want, so you might as well just give up. And then there are times where we just get angry, and we begin to fight. And by golly, I'm going to get control of this thing. By golly, I'm going to get control of my circumstances. By golly, I'm going to get control over them, so they start behaving the way that they need to, need to behave. And so we fight, or at least we die trying. I know I've felt all of those emotions before. You know why? Because I desire invincibility. I think we all desire invincibility. In fact, here's the truth. Did you know that God desires for you to be invincible? In fact, scripture says that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. The problem is, the reason why we haven't really experienced a lot of invincibility in our life is because we tend to have this idea of invincibility that's very different than than that of God's. And so we don't experience it. We think invincibility is, is I need to be stronger. I need to be smarter. I need to grab on it. I need to figure this thing out better. And I need to manage this better. And so we grip and we get, you know, the more that we try to get, gain control, the more we get out of control. And sometimes as Christians, we could, we could be a Christian for 20, 30, 40 years and still not feel a sense of inf- invincibility. And I think what happens there is a couple of things. Well, probably more than that, but two key ones. One is is we haven't really fully understood what invincibility is or how God views invincibility and and how he brings that about in our life and why he does what he does to bring invincibility in our lives. And so since we don't understand that, we take what we've learned from the world and we try to shove God or scripture into that. And so when our circumstances go the way that we want them to go, 
then we get mad at God. God, if you want me to be invincible, why did I lose my job? Why did I get this illness? Why did they leave me? And we just all go in a, in a tailspin. It's because we take this view of what our life should be and how it should be managed and what invincibility is all about. And we take God and we try to shove him into that. Or we may know what God is doing and how he brings about strength and invincibility in us, but we just don't trust him. So we kind of go back and revert back to what we do know, and that is putting the hands on the steering wheel. And by golly, I'm going to figure this out. By golly, it's going to be all, you know, me. I'm going to get this. I'm going to figure it out. And uh, I'm going to control this situation, control these people. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I think every single one of us in this room, if we were gut honest with ourselves, would realize that it doesn't work. And guess what? It hasn't worked since the beginning of time. Since the beginning of time, people have been striving after this whole idea of an invictus. But very few have really experienced it. I'm, I'm talking about on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, we've all experienced probably a little bit of it. Maybe you got a trophy at one time and you felt strong. Maybe you got a pay raise and, and got a bigger title at work. And so you felt invincible at work. And maybe that one time when your child said, yes, mom, you're like, whoa, I feel invincible as a parent. But we all know that that's short-lived, right? And so we can feel very vulnerable. See, my hope is for you over the next six weeks, it's a couple things. One is, as we kind of go on this journey on Invictus, is first of all, that um, you would see with great clarity of how God does desire for you to live an invincible life. And what that means and how he goes about it and why he does what he does. Because let me tell you, it's totally different than the way that the world goes about seeking invincibility. It's very, 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 very different. That's why I think a lot of times we get very confused with that. So I'm hoping that you get some clarity with that. The second thing is, is that I hope that through this process, that not only do you see it with clarity, that you begin to understand that, man, God's way is very counterintuitive to the way that I was grown up with, but it is the best way. And that he is a good God, that he does know what he's doing, and that he does actually really do care about you, no matter what the circumstances are going on in your life. And then recognize that you can trust him. And that's my hope for you. So this morning, we're going to begin our journey on Invictus, and we're going to begin our journey in the year, um, in the year 356 B.C. That's right. I'm going to get a little historical on you. And the reason why I want to get historical on you is, is I want you to see with great clarity the difference between the way that man has, has striven for Invictus and the way that God builds Invictus within man. In the year 356 BC, there was a guy who was rising in power in the northern region of what we call today Greece. And as he was striving for his own invincibility, if you will, he began to subdue the tribes and the clans around them and bring them all under his, own, his one rulership. And through that process, he defeated this town. And it was a very strategic town for two reasons. One, it was right there on the coast. It was very accessible. And second of all, there was a ton of gold and silver um, in, the, in them dare hills around there in this town by which he can mine and fund his, his invincibility, if you will. Well, like every ego-driven, uh, invictus-seeking individual of the past, he named this city after himself. And the name of this city is called Philippi, which literally means pertaining to Philip. The man's name was Philip of Macedon II. When Philip died... He left his, his growing kingdom to his son and left this very strategic city to his son, not only for military strategy, but even more so to, to fund his, his son's military conquest. And the other thing that Philip of Macedon gave to his son was this insatiable need, if you will, for Invictus, for invincibility. And his son... <laughs> humanly speaking, did an amazing job seeking after <clears throat> invincibility. And he got further than most people do. You see, <clears throat> he conquered all of the Grecian peninsula, and then he took on the most powerful empire in the world at the time, which were the Persians, and he defeated the Persians. And he overtook all of eastern Mediterranean region, all the way into Egypt, and he pushed all the way through modern-day Iraq, 
to modern day Iran and all the way into India. And he did it all in his early 30s. In fact, since that time, people have given him this big title, kind of recognizing, wow, if there's anybody who came close to invincibility, it must be this guy. Philip of Macedon's son, his name is Alexander. He was Alexander the Great. And the city of Philippi was pretty much the uh, place that helped fund Alexander's conquest because of the gold and the silver there. Our city of Philippi laid quiet for about 200 years or so until another group came on the scene. You see, human history shows, if you go back and just look at history after history after history after time after time, you will see, given enough time, that there's always another group. There's always another group that rises up who is hungrier, who fights harder for invincibility. And during this time, that group were the Romans. And the Romans conquered the Greeks, conquered Philippi. But here's what something is really interesting about our city, Philippi, when it comes to the Romans. See, Philippi was the, was the city that really paved the way for Alexander the Great's uh, um, pursuit of Invictus. But it's also at Philippi where the Romans reached its height of seeking after Invictus or invincibility. Let me tell you, in 44 BC, the Roman Senate, see at that time, the Roman government was a democratic republic. A democratic republic. For 700 years, they were a democratic republic. A democratic republic is where the people vote for representatives to rule on their behalf. America, in a lot of ways, was built on a democratic republic. We vote and we vote uh, representatives, senators, in order to represent us and rule and govern our country. The Romans were the same way. But in 44 BC, the, the Senate, the majority of the Senate, did something that was unprecedented in the history of Rome. They gave one individual the titer, title, Dictator Perpetuo. and gave this person the power of a dictator by which he controlled the military, the finances, and the laws. And as you can imagine, there was a minority of senators who thought that was not a really good idea. And the person that they gave it to was, a, was a, the Roman Julius Caesar. Well, a few days after that, the minority of senators decided we got to do something about it. And so what they did is they decided that what they, they needed to take Julius Caesar out. And so they, they went to assassinate him. And they did. There was a group of them that converged upon him. They stabbed him and they killed him. Now, Julius Caesar didn't have a son. And so all the wealthy landowners at the time always adopted people in order to have an heir. Well, Julius Caesar didn't have one, and so he adopted his grandnephew, a guy named Octavian. And Octavian was a young adult when Julius Caesar was murdered. And Octavian, with uh, Julius Caesar's most accomplished general, Mark Antony, went after the conspirators. And the conspirators were, ruled, were, were led by a guy, guy named Brutus and another guy named Cassius. Now, both of these guys, both of these two groups were heavily armed. They both had close to um, 20 legions apiece. And so when Octavian and Mark Anthony went after Cassius and Brutus with, their, with their, all their military might, they caught up with them at our city of Philippi. And it was there at Philippi that Mark Anthony and Octavian went to battle against Brutus and Cassius. There were over 200,000 Roman soldiers, 100,000 on one side, 100,000 on the other. It was, it was the biggest, the largest congregation of Roman soldiers in the, in, the, in the history of the empire. And it was an epic struggle of Invictus. It was those who were about the, the um, you know, democratic republic and those who were the imperialists. Octavian and Mark Antony, Cassius and Brutus. In history we know... Octavian and Mark Antony won, uh, won out. And it was at Philippi that the Roman Republic was dead. And the Roman Empire was given birth. By which was ruled by one absolutely incredibly powerful individual. Where this adopted son of Julius Caesar, Octavian, became the first Roman Emperor. He had a new name. His name was was Caesar Augustus, who would, in his own battle, strive for invincibility 
over and lead and have power over the most powerful empire the world has ever known at the time. And it all started in our, our city of Philippi. When Luke wrote his work on Jesus' life, at the beginning of Jesus' birth, when he was telling him about it, he starts off by this. He says, in the days of Caesar Augustus, and then he kind of goes on. And he wasn't saying that just to give us a historical marker. That's part of it. But Caesar Augustus went on and, and ran and led um, Rome for another 14 plus years after Jesus' birth. He was doing it to communicate something to us, I believe. I think he was communicating that in the days of Caesar Augustus, when everybody thought that Caesar Augustus was the Invictus one, he was the invincible one, there was one who was truly invincible who was born. But he was different. This Invictus one was different. Where one sought invincibility after might and money and manipulation and killing and murder and subduing and controlling. The other one who was invincible grew up and instead of trying to control his life, he gave control to his heavenly father because he loved him and he trusted him. And instead of controlling his circumstances, he leveraged his circumstances to bring people's hearts back to God, even to the point of giving up his own life and dying on a cross. And he didn't control people, he served them with all of his heart. So let me ask you a question. Where's Greece? Where's Rome? Where's Alexander's empire? Where's Augustus' empire? How about Jesus' empire? Where's that? See, God has a totally different way of changing people's lives. He has a totally different way when it comes to Invictus. If you think about anybody who was invincible, it was Jesus Christ. He was, he, was, he was ditched. People left him, but he was okay. He was all right. He was beaten up. He didn't say a word. He was unfairly accused of things that he did not do. But he was fine. And he was pierced in his own flesh. But he said, Father, forgive them. No, they do not know what they do. That's invincibility. Well, 90 years after four men came into Philippi to strive for the power of Rome, Cassius and Brutus and Octavian and Mark Antony, 90 years after them, there were four guys who came into Philippi. They didn't come with 40 legions of soldiers. They didn't come with pomp and circumstances. But they did come with something even more powerful. And these guys' names were Paul and Timothy, and Silas, and Luke. And so around 50 AD, these guys come walking into our town of Philippi. They didn't come to control and manipulate the people. They weren't coming to build their own selfish empire. But they did come with a sense of invincibility. They did come with a sense of strength. And they did come to tell people about the one who can give them invincibility, the one who loves them. And so they came into the city and they began to proclaim Jesus Christ to these people. And the first person to start following Jesus Christ there was a, was a rich, wealthy, Jewish fashion designer, seller of, of fashion goods, a gal named Lydia. And then there was a poor slave girl who was used and abused who was uh, possessed by a demon with this ability to predict the future and there were men who used this girl to to monetize her to make money after her and out of her and so Paul through Christ heals and frees this young slave girl and you can imagine those who were making money off of her, how they reacted to that. They didn't like it too much. And honestly, we don't really like it too much when we have our hands on the wheel and God takes the wheel away from us. Whether it's our money, whether it's our control over our lives, or whatever it is, we tend to get really mad. And they got mad, and they got mad at Paul, and they got mad at Silas because they just lost their, their income stream off of using and abusing this little girl. And they take them, and they take them to the city magistrate, and they create all this big old riot around these two. And the magistrates take Paul, and they take Silas, and they beat the crud out of them. 
And they beat him, and they beat him. And this isn't the first time that Paul has ever been beaten before. He's been stoned, left for dead. They <laughs> drug him out of town thinking that he was left, that he was dead just to be eaten by vultures and just become a carcass. He's been through many different difficulties and hardships, and here he is again being beaten to where possibly he couldn't see out of an eye and a bloody lip and bruises all over him. And same thing with Silas. And they say, put him in jail. Put him in jail into the innermost part of that jail and keep an eye on him. Put, put, put him in stock so they can't go anywhere. So they're in this cave way in the back to where they need it. If they need to go to the restroom, where they're going? They're going right there. Okay. You can read all of this. Luke who, um, wrote all this stuff down for, you, for us. And it's in Acts chapter 16. But what's something that you see here is Paul doesn't react the way that we normally react. I think if there was anybody who could get ticked at God, it would have been Paul. I mean, think about it. God, I've done everything for you. I've given up everything. I've given up a lucrative career for you. I've left everything to go and tell people good news about you. And you allowed this to happen to me? You allowed this beating to occur into my life? You allowed me to go into this inner jail never knowing when, I'm gonna, when am I going to get out? I don't even know when I'm going to get out. I think that's our natural inclination, the natural way that we, we would deal with such a situation. God, why is this circumstance? Why did you allow this circumstance to be? See, we can say that, but, but, if, but Paul has a right to say it because he's doing it all in the honor of God. But guess what? He doesn't do that. What does he do? What do they do? They sing. They sing praises to God. Whoa! How in the world does somebody who does all of these things for God and God allows him to get beaten, thrown into a jail, never knowing where they can get out, and they're singing praises to him? You know why? Because they understand something about God. And they also understand about what God is doing in this world. They understand, they, they, they fell in love with Jesus Christ a long time ago, and so they gave him control. That's why they, when Paul says, Lord Jesus, he actually means it. Not just, hey, Lord Jesus, we love you, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. It's, no, Lord Jesus, if you're willing to give up your life for me, I'm willing to give it up to you. I trust you. I trust in what you've done. And so they, he trusted him tremendously. He wasn't trying to control the situation. If you look at Paul's life, Paul never tried to control his life in circumstances. Um, not because he give out, gave up. It was, it was only because he trusted God and said, okay, God, leverage this for your good and your kingdom. And he knew that God would. And he wasn't there to, you know, and so he wasn't there to control anybody or anything like that. He was just simply there to praise God, that God is good, and that God has a better plan for his life and has eternity. Well, then, things begin to shake and rumble, and the doors open. By that time, the Roman jailer wakes up, and he sees that the doors are open, and he thinks that the slaves, the, um, the, the um, prisoners, have walked, because that's what prisoners do when the gates open and the jailers fall asleep. They walk. And so, because he felt like, since he, you know, failed, he takes out a sword to kill himself, because he failed on the job. And here's the thing, Paul's in the position of power over this jailer now, right? Normal inclination is to use that power to step back and just kind of watch him kill himself and then walk on past him and, and go. Because after all, this, is, this, is, this guy is part of the enemy. This is the guy who may have been a part of or at least represented the beatings that he took. But he doesn't do that. Do you know what he does? He says to the jailer, no, 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 stop, 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 don't do anything. Don't kill yourself. Don't harm yourself. We're still here. We didn't take the chance to bolt. We stayed because we trust that God's going to do something cool. So he just says, don't, 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 don't do anything. And then the jailer says something absolutely powerful. I don't think he under, really fully understood when he asked it how powerful of a question it was because he asked the question, what must I do to be saved? I think he was thinking physically. I don't think he was thinking spiritually. And then Paul gave this Roman Something better, a better salvation than just his physical life. A better inv invincibility that the Roman Empire could give this Roman jailer. An invincibility that comes through Jesus Christ. And so he begins to tell him about Christ, about this invincible one. 
who instead of controlling everybody, gave up control and gave up his own life, by which through the power of God raised him from the dead so that we too can have eternal life. The jailer took him and Silas to his home, cleaned him up, and his whole family said yes to Christ, and they were baptized that day, and their eternal tra trajectory changed forever. And here's the deal. This is Paul's first church plant in Europe. So Paul plants a church with a wealthy Jewish fashionista, with an ex-slave girl, and a blue-collar jailer. Usually when we try to start a grand movement, those aren't usually the people that we choose to pick to change the world. But this is the people that God used. Why did he use them? Because they came under the umbrella of the invincible one and trusted him. And God moved, used them to change the world. Paul ended up leaving Philippi in about, um, and he went on to share um, the good news about Jesus Christ all over the place. And about 10 years later, he was in prison again. And um, he was in prison. He wrote a letter to his brothers and sisters at Philippi. It's a beautiful, amazing letter. It's kind of interesting when you think about it that here, when he walked into the city, he was in prison. And now he's writing a letter in prison. And he writes this amazing letter. He writes this letter that says beautiful things like rejoice in the Lord always, a peace that surpasses all understanding. I've learned the secret of being content. And you, sometimes when you read these things, you kind of gloss over it and you kind of think they're kind of self-help positive stuff. But here's something we all need to recognize is that this letter wasn't written by a pastor in a nice air-conditioned study who thought great grand thoughts by which he could communicate and motivate other people. This was written by a real practitioner. When he says those things, he believes them. And not only does he believe them, he lived them and he experienced them. And so this is what we're going to do in our journey on Invictus. Got some homework to do this week, guys. And um, this is going to be really important um, to really kind of get this and soak this in. I want you to read Paul's letter to the Philippians. It's going to rock your world. And I want you to read it like a letter because it is a letter. It's a historical letter written by a historical guy to a historical group of people by which he built a relationship with, got to know them, and then later on wrote a letter back to them. And when you read this letter, I want you to read it with this question. How does Paul, how did Paul get there? How did he get to this place of invincibility? And if you read this letter and you pay attention to it and you really work through this over the next six weeks, you're going to get it. And you're going to see it. And I think it's going to rock your world. I personally do. I really believe it. And this is really important for those of you who feel like that you live in a, in a financial box. You need to read this. If you feel like you're imprisoned um, physically, you can't do what you could do in the past, and you feel like you can't serve or have an impact with anybody, you have to read this letter. Because this letter is written by a type A guy in prison. If you want to do anything to get a type A guy down, put him in a cubicle. Put him in a prison. But he uses that by which most of our New Testament is written by most of which, by which we know. God leverages that. You've got to read this. You've got to read this letter. And those of you who feel like, man, I just haven't really gotten a lot of this invincibility in my life. There's still a lot of stress and anxiety in my life. You've got to read this letter with the whole idea of God. Let me step back and let me learn from you. How do you bring about Invictus into my life? Open up my heart. See, because when you read through Philippians, some, especially you Christian people, you're going to be reading some stuff in there, and you're going to go, man, okay, I've, you know, I've, I've seen that, I've heard that verse. There's, there's going to be a lot of them. Uh, Philippians is like a coffee mug letter. There's so many of those verses. But here's the thing. Coffee mug letter uh, verses, or just verses by which become a mantra in your life, will not make you Invictus. But there's something that will, if you read this letter and ask the question, how did he get there? I want to end my time with you guys by just starting off by opening up this letter to you and reading it to you. So if you have your Bible, you would flip over to Philippians chapter 1. 
And we're going to read just the beginning passage. And in your mind, I want you to realize that this really is a letter from a real guy to a real group of people who he has a real relationship with. And so he starts off and he says, this letter is from Paul and Timothy. So he's writing it out. You're listening to it if you're there like the first time. This letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. I'm writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the elders and deacons. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the the time you first heard it 10 years ago until now. And I am certain that that God who began the good work when when Timothy and, and Silas and Luke and I came into your city and told you about Jesus Christ and the way that you responded and all the amazing things he did in the beginning of all that work that he has done, I am convinced, I am certain that he will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So it's right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender and compassion of Christ Jesus. The next few verses here, I come, I switch from the New Living Translation, which is what we usually use here on Sunday morning, to the NIV. Because this is important to me, because this next few verses is the, is the verses that Kimberly and I chose for, for Calvin. And this, is, this has kind of been our prayer for him for his, all his 10 years of his life. And, you know, when, when Paul says, every time I think of you, I pray for you, this is what he's praying for the Philippians. And I believe that if Paul were alive today, this is exactly the prayer that he would be praying for all of us here. And over the next six weeks, I'm gonna be praying this prayer for you guys because this is my prayer for you, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so you may be able to discern what is best, that God's ways are the best. They're not just self-help great ideas. They really are the best, even though they seem so counterintuitive and so strange. That's my prayer for you. That as you get the sense of God's love for you and you begin to see with clarity the way that God works, that you would be able to discern that God's way is better than Alexander's ways or Caesar's way. It's my prayer for you. That you'd be able to discern what is best and maybe pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled, filled all the way to the top, the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Amen.